folks, BC here. You're watching Deuce and Guns, and today I want to answer probably the most common question on my channel, which is, hey BC, I'm about to look at a deuce and a half to buy. What should I be looking for? Well, I'm going to tell you. Alrighty, first of all, let's start with the basics. Number one, do not get caught up in who manufactured the engine. They were all made the same specifications. There's no engine manufacturer that was better or worse than the other. And while we're talking about engines, let's talk about the two different types of engines you're probably going to come across when you're shopping for a deuce and a half. This is all information about the M35A2, by the way. The majority of the engines you're going to find are going to be either C-code or D-code. Of course, the C-code came before the D-code. They both make the same amount of power. They're both just as reliable. Just a slight difference in head gasket sealing in the D-code engine is just a little bit better. It's nothing to uh, worry about, honestly. If you come across a good deuce that's a C-code versus D-code or vice versa, go for it. It really doesn't matter. Furthermore, in regards to engines, completely disregard any kind of odometer reading because the military changed out odometers willy-nilly uh, without ever actually matching the old odometer reading to the new odometer reading. When odometer went bad, they just throw in a new unit with uh, zero miles on it or they would salvage an old unit, so there's no telling how many miles are on the truck. Now, my truck actually came to me with uh, 48,000 miles on it, I believe, and I have no idea if that's accurate. I have no idea what's on the chassis. I do know that the transmission's been rebuilt at least once, uh, and that may not be the original transmission. It could have gone through several transmissions, four or five, I have no idea. Also, I do know that the data plate on the engine, which is a decode Hercules, the data plate says October of 1987, which means that was its build date. The October 1987 build date does not mean that's when it was installed in the uh, truck here. So that engine was probably sitting in a warehouse for a decade. It might have been installed here in the 90s. Who knows? Because there's no paperwork to actually back up any of that. And now let's say that you found a deuce that you're interested in. Call the owner and ask the normal questions you would for any other vehicle. Was it maintained correctly? Uh, how often do you change the oil? What do you use it for? Uh, do you drive it often? Does it have any issues? Does it have any maintenance issues that need to be taken care of? Things of that nature, just like any other vehicle that you'd be purchasing from an individual private party. And I almost forgot, make sure the deuce you're looking at actually has a title because when the government auctioned these things off, they did not come with titles. They came with basically a purchasing certificate and you took that down to your state's DMV and you got a title issued to you. Now, depending on your state, depending on your DMV, that could be a very easy, quick process or a very difficult and long process. So make sure that the deuce you're looking at actually has a title just to keep you from having any kind of issues further down the road. Okay, let's say the owner answers all your questions satisfactorily. Great, and you're still interested in this deuce. Awesome. Now, tell the owner you're gonna come stop by, check out the deuce, and tell the owner that you do not want them to start it. You wanna hear a cold start on a deuce. If you show up and you put your hand on a manifold this warm, walk away because the owner's probably hiding something. Because you want a cold start to listen to see if it has any issues. Most diesel engines and most multi-fuel engines start no problem when it's warm. When it's cold, that's when the issues show up if there are any. Now if the deuce hadn't been started in months and months, you know, there's spider webs on the fan and whatnot, you can tell it's not been started in a long time then it could take a few cranks. It could take a little bit of cranking to get the fuel pressurized to actually get her started. That is normal. But if the owner brings out a can of ether to get it started and starts spraying it into the intake, walk away. There is some serious wrong with that engine. That engine does not need ether to get started unless it is crazy cold, 30 degrees or so below zero Fahrenheit. Other than that, this engine is going to start up like a dream without any issues. All right, now, before you actually start up the engine, you want to take a look at everything first. So, first of all, go ahead and climb up on the fender, open up the hood, feel the engine, make sure it's nice and cool. Mine's been running a little bit, so it's a little bit toasty. And you want to check the radiator. Now, you open it up. It's like a normal car. And there should be radiator fluid right about here down below the neck. Just barely be able to see it because that allows it to expand. Also, make sure that the coolant color is nice and green like a normal vehicle should be. Now, keep in mind that a diesel does use a diesel spec coolant, so don't get that switched up with a normal vehicle. Also, you want to check the 
oil here. So take out the dipstick. This is not the way you're going to check the oil level, although there should be some oil on the dipstick here. It unscrews because they're, of course, watertight. And you want to look at that, and you want to take a look at the oil on there. And hopefully, it's going to look like normal oil. If it looks like chocolate milk, walk away, because that means the head gasket is bad, and it's leaking coolant into the crankcase, into the oil. It's getting sloshed up and is making basically what amounts to chocolate milk. Also, if you find some gunk in the coolant, that could be oil getting into the coolant, again, walk away, unless you're really into changing out the head gasket on one of these. And over here, make sure that the Deuce's air filter is actually there. And just take a look, you can tell just from the edge to see that it actually is fairly nice and clean. So, go ahead and button it back up. You're ready to start her up. Also, take a look at the actual brake fluid itself. It should not be cloudy. It should be a very clear. It'll be tinted red, but it should be clear and not cloudy. If it is cloudy, it's got some water or moisture issues. And also, the level of the brake fluid should be right near the bottom of the threads. Now, you can take a look at the brake fluid reservoir through the access panel in the bottom of the driver's side of the cab, right near your feet. Also, remember to check the three engine belts to make sure they're not frayed, cracked, or excessively loose. The same rules apply to your normal standard uh, sedan versus the deuce and a half engine. And now it's time to start the deuce. So if the engine stop button is not already pushed in, go ahead and push that sucker in. There's a lever there, the ignition switch. Turn it from the off position to the on position. And when you do that, because there should be no pressure in the air system, you should get a nice buzz. If you don't, that's a problem because that should be there. It's a safety feature you need. Very nice. Now get a few moments to actually let the diesel pressurize from the fuel tank. Make sure you're out of gear. And push the red button. There you go. Well, that's a good sound. <laughs> I can do that because the deuce is already warmed up. I've been driving it all day. Don't rev your deuce when you first start it. Try to get the air pressure up. Stop the buzz. There we go. That's better. Once the air pressure hits 60 PSI, it goes all the way to 120. Once you hit 60, that means that you're safe to drive it and the, uh, the brakes will work with 60 PSI. So the buzz goes off then. You should reach 120 PSI on the gauge pretty quickly actually at this point you can also hear the uh, turbo there's that turbo sound okay I'm going to go ahead and turn that off now and now let's quickly run through the gauges here the speed of course should be zero you're sitting still the fuel level should be whatever's in it hopefully if it's reading something it should go up somewhere Hopefully the guy does not have the thing running on empty. The uh, tachometer should be showing at idle once it's warmed up at about 7,800 you know, RPM. Now, when it's cold, when it's completely cold, you may have to use the uh, throttle lever over here to get it about 1,000 RPM and let it warm up there. That's completely normal. That is not unusual. So, cold engine, pull that throttle just, you know, just two notches maybe, one, two notches, and you're good. That'll keep you at about 1,000 RPM. And then once it's warmed up completely, once the actually air, you know, low air indicator stops, then you can push that back in usually, and it'll lower back down to about seven or 800 RPM. Now the oil pressure should be sitting about 30. Now I have heard there was a mix up in the military with the different types of cinders. Some cinders will actually read about 15, but it should be 30 if everything is correctly done. The air pressure, should have climbed very quickly, hit the 60 mark within a minute or two, and then continued all the way to 120. The generator should be almost straight to the green. It might charge a little bit if it's not been started for a while. I might have to charge the batteries up, but it should be right in the green area. And temperature gauge should be zero because, of course, you ask the owner to not start the engines. The engine should be cold. So that will climb up once you, it takes a while to get 
gallons and gallons of oil and gallons and gallons of antifreeze warmed up. But once it's fully warmed up and operational, it should be around 180 degrees Fahrenheit. And as the truck warms up and the pressure builds, walk around the truck, take a look at the tires, make sure there's plenty of life left in them because they are not cheap, especially when you need to buy 10 of them, 11 if you want the spare to match. And also check the PSI on a couple of them just to make sure they're all around 50 PSI. And now, if you've not actually driven a deuce and a half before, go ahead and take a look at my link here about shifting on a deuce because the uh, shift pattern is a little bit wonky. And also second gear, when you're going from first to second, second gear is a little stiff on all of them. That is completely expected. But once you actually change over the transmission oil to a straight weight 30, 40, or 50 weight oil, like specified by the manufacturer Spicer. The shift to second is a little bit easier, but it's still stiff. It's still not a sports car and never will be. And during your test drive, pay attention to the brake pedal. The brake pedal should be firm, but not overly mushy, soft, or extra, extra hard. It uh, should feel like a normal, decent sized truck. The brake pedal in my F250 feels very similar to the brake pedal in my Deuce and a Half. It should not feel mushy, it should not go all the way to the floor, nor should it be rock hard from the very top. And now you're done with your test drive and you got a few more things to check before you can make your final offer and decision on buying this douche or not. Number one is to check the lift pump and the fuel tank. Now, you can't hear the lift pump when the low pressure buzzer is going off nor when the truck is running. So I'm going to show you right now what this sounds like, what it should sound like when it's actually working correctly. Hold on. Now with the truck not running, but the air pressure up and the ignition switch on, you can hear the lift pump running. Now the deuce and a half will run without the lift pump, but it's extra hard on the high pressure pumps in the engine. So make sure this is working. Sometimes it's just a uh, fuse or breaker, but sometimes the actual motor itself and pump itself is burnt out. Also, once the test drive is over, turn everything off and just sit in the cab and listen. Listen for the telltale sign of the hiss of high pressure air escaping from the airlines. As you can tell, I do not have that because I have fixed the vast majority of my air leaks. There's only one air leak left and it's actually in the gauge, which is why it's kind of fogged up. Now that was not the case when I first bought this deuce. I picked it up, I could hear the hiss. I thought it was normal. I'd heard it before in other deuces, so I thought it was normal. I didn't have a channel like this on the internet to tell me that it was not a normal thing. So driving at home in the interstate, and the hiss got louder and got louder till finally the uh, air compressor could not keep up and it actually lowered below the um, buzzer limit warning which was 60 psi so once it reached below 60 the buzzer started going off and the emergency bells start going off pull over because you could lose your brakes so I'll pull over off the interstate uh, to the first truck stop I came across stopped it when I turn it off, the air pressure basically just immediately flatlined down to zero. So obviously I had a problem. And it went digging behind my dash and I pulled out two air hoses. One of them went to the actual gauge, the air gauge, and the other one went to the um, pneumatic switch that actuates the front axle front wheel drive. And now I took the two air lines. They were so bad in dry rod, I'd actually tear them apart in my hands if I wanted to. And luckily the actual truck stop had a Napa complete full service Napa Auto Center on the grounds, which was great. I took those uh, air hoses in and they built me completely new ones and with a little bit of Teflon tape, I was golden. And actually that solved all my leaks except for the tiny little one and the gauge itself. Everything else is kind of personal preferences. Do you want the Sprague front end that automatically engages the front wheels when the rear ones slip? Or do you want the uh, pneumatic front end drive basically where you can engage the front axle whenever you want to? I recommend the latter because the Sprague front end can cause some problems if you are a little um, overzealous with the first gear and the throttle. And also, while not being a deal breaker, walk around and make sure all the bulbs work, all the switches work as far as like the uh, turn signals and hazard lights and the headlights work, both uh, high and low beam. Just make sure all that works because it is kind of a hassle trying to find 24 volt bulbs. They are available, you usually have to order them from the internet, so if they're not working, Maybe the owner has some spares around they can give you, or maybe they'll give you a few bucks extra just to help you out and get those things taken care of. Now remember, the Deuce and a Half is a 24 volt system, so it's got two full size car batteries in there. So take a look at the battery box, make sure that the batteries are up to date and fairly new. Uh, now, technically, the, the correct battery for the Deuce and a Half is actually two 
separate heavy-duty military-grade batteries, but you can get away with two full-size car batteries in there. That's what I've got, and they're just fine. And that's pretty much the nuts and bolts of looking at a deuce and a half for a purchase. Everything else is pretty much like a normal old vehicle purchase. How much rust is on it? How much does it leak? What does it leak? And are those things deal breakers? Well, guys, all I got for you today. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you found it helpful. If you have any comments, questions, or show ideas, leave them in the comment box below the video. I try to get to as many of those as possible. And for the rest of the evening, I'm going to go ahead and enjoy this fall day. I suggest you do the same. See ya.